Another dawn that started so full of promise and ended in yet another rainy day at Malvern. I have to say, I never cease to be amazed at the resilience of traders and shoppers as they hurry between stores buried beneath tarpaulins, hoping to make the deal of the day and find that elusive bargain. But eventually, the rain drains the enthusiasm of even the most persistent amongst us, and we have no choice but to head to the covered hall. And therein lies the problem. The halls became packed, and it was more like a bun fight than an antiques fair. All the best stock was snapped up immediately, and I think it was safe to say it was a dealer's paradise with demand heavily outstripping supply. So how did I get on? Stay tuned and find out. So it's a couple of days later, and we're back at HQ. Before I run through my, what is really a small haul from the days picking at Malvern in the rain, I thought I'd start the film by showing you an interesting sale, to say the least. And here it is. I will cut in some proper photographs of this etching, because I'm sure there's reflections all over the place here. Now, this etching I picked up as part of a job lot for next to nothing a um, few months ago. When I saw it, I thought there's something special about this. It's signed Gerald L. Brockhurst. Meant nothing to me at the time. Took a punt on it. As I always say, go with your gut reaction when you're out sourcing or picking. And this is a classic example of your gut reaction, or my gut reaction, I should say, uh, paying off. So, what I'll do, I'll cut a few photos in and talk you through exactly who Gerald L. Brockhurst is and a little bit of backstory to this etching. So, I hope you enjoy this little deviation from the main topic of the film. Let me know in the comments below. And... Uh, if I have any other similar items like this in the future, then I'll do a little feature on those as well. So here we go, let's take a look. Before we talk in any detail about the etching, I thought I'd give you a little bit of a biography of Gerald L. Brockhurst. Well, he was born in the Edgebaston district of Birmingham, my hometown, on the 31st of October, 1890 and he was the son of a coal merchant called Arthur Brockhurst. He obviously showed a lot of talent in drawing skills, and uh, he was accepted into the Birmingham School of Art, believe it or not, at the age of 12. He eventually went on to become a pupil at the Royal Academy School in 1907, where he won a gold medal and a travelling scholarship in 1913. This enabled him to visit France and Italy and led to a close study of 15th century artists such as Piero della Francesca, Botticelli and even Leonardo da Vinci, whose work had an abiding influence on him. And maybe you can see that influence in the etching I acquired. From 1915 to 1919, Brockhurst and his wife, Anne lived in Ireland where they were friendly with the artist Augustus John, you may have heard of him, and his circle of fellow artists. He held his first important exhibition in 1919 in London. And after it was well received there, well, he grasped the nettle and returned to live there. He followed the money, I guess. In 1921, he was one of the early members of the newly formed Society of Graphic Arts and exhibited with them. Throughout the 30s, he continued an increasingly successful career as a portrait artist with notable sitters, including film stars such as Merle Oberon, Marlena Dietrich and members of the royal family, including the Duchess of Windsor. In 1958, believe it or not, he appeared as a guest challenger on the TV panel show To Tell the Truth, which you can view on YouTube and I'll leave a link below. Gerald Leslie Brockhurst eventually settled in Franklin Lakes, New Jersey, United States, where he died on the 4th of May, 1978. 
So there you go. There's a short potted history of Gerald L. Brockhurst. And I thought you might be interested to know a little bit more about him. His biography, if you want to read even more, is uh, freely available. You can Google it on, uh, on the, anywhere on the internet. He's quite a well-known guy. And I just think that that little bit of background will put some perspective on what I achieved for this etching when I sold it. So now let's have a little look at the etching itself. So this particular etching by Gerald Brockhurst is known as a Galway peasant and it's also known as an Irish peasant. It was etched in 1920 and he's signed in pencil on the lower right which you can clearly see here. As far as I understand it there was an initial print run of 55. I'm not sure what number this particular example is but it'd be one of the 55. It's interesting to note that uh, he was a Birmingham born artist although he moved away at quite uh, a young age but it's interesting to see that this particular etching found its way home and I picked it up. I actually subsequently found out that there were actually 63 prints in total but only 55 of them were signed and luckily enough I've got one of the signed ones. Also, the plate for this etching is known to have been cancelled, so it's highly unlikely there will be any reproductions of it. This particular etching, a Galway peasant, is one of a number of portrait studies which Brockhurst made of local peasant people in Northern Ireland. Laid on cream paper, it has four margins and a decal edge. This particular example is in what I would call good condition. Another example in this series of etchings by Brockhurst is a Connemara peasant. So now the all important question, what did I achieve when I sold it? Well, I have seen previous examples sold for as high as 450 UK pounds. But there was no way I was going to achieve that on eBay. And I did take it to an auction house along with two or three other paintings that I've subsequently sold, but they weren't interested in it. Um, quite funny, they, they said what I'm looking for is a goth with some money. I can see where they're coming from. It is very gothic revival in uh, appearance. Um, but I thought, no, I'm not going to put it through an auction and achieve only 10, 20, 30 pounds. I'm going to take it home, relist it and see what I can get for it, which is what I did. It was listed for quite a length of time and I actually achieved 185 pounds, including shipping. I was happy with that. I could have stuck out for more. But I thought that was a fair price. Hopefully the buyer's pleased as well. And maybe they're a collector. I don't know anything about the buyer other than the address where it's going to. So overall, I was pleased with that. A sale price of 185 including shipping. It will be dispatched via Royal Mail and it will be tracked, signed for special delivery because I think it deserves that. So there you go. Now, let's have a look at the little haul I got from a rain-soaked Mulvern. Okay, I'll go through the items I picked up from Malvern in the order that they are now listed in my eBay shop. So if any of you want to follow the progress of these items, then take a look at the link below, which will take you straight to my eBay shop, which is Antiques Vintage Collectibles, AVC, and I think it's uh, 2017. So. Antiques Vintage Collectibles 2017 and that should get you to my shop and be great if you follow it and you can see all of the items that I have listed and any new items uh, that come in you'll be notified of them as well so that's all good. Okay so let's have a look in order of listing at the nine items I purchased from Malvern. So we'll kick off first of all with a early 20th century magazine rack. So it's listed as vintage album vinyl record magazine rack, two compartments, brass and steel wire. Now I would date this to the early part of the 20th century. It's got a kind of um pre-war Edwardian look to me. Uh, 
the wire on the reverse side is actually steel so I think that is a more contemporary repair it's had done and that's reflected in the listing price which currently is £40. I'd probably expect to take an offer of £35 on this particular item. The big USP these items have now is people use them to uh, stack their vinyl albums in when they're listening to them. Uh, so, you know, they do have a functional use other than being a magazine rack, which isn't really that fashionable anymore. Okay, moving on, we have a small decorative item and it's a vintage pewter and brass trinket dish in the form of a duck. Now it has a removable lid, so it's not only decorative but it's also functional and in my opinion affordable as well and listed at £19.95. pence. Nice little uh, decorative functional item, bit of a catch-all being pewter with brass inlay, you can use it just about anywhere. Put your rings in when you're washing up, um, all sorts of uses for it. But uh, decorative as well. And I think at £19.95, probably take an offer of uh, around sort of £17.95. It's a nice little item for a buyer looking for something a little bit different. Can't find anything similar online. So uh, if you're interested in it, take a look in the shop and get your offer in. Next up, these are always incredibly popular. We have a pair of antique slash vintage, but I'm pretty sure they're certainly early 20th century, if not, if not late 19th century. And they're Indian clubs and they're used for exercise or for uh, juggling obviously, uh, and I've already had a couple of inquiries for these. Sold a pair in the last month for, and I think I'm pretty sure I achieved £55 for them, or it could have been 45 actually. No, I think it was £45. So I've currently got these listed at 50 and goes without saying I would accept an offer of £45, but let's see how they go. Interestingly, they do have some initials carved in the top of each of the clubs which will either put buyers off or is part of the patina and the history the provenance of them jh are the letters so a little bit of history carved into the clubs as well so i think starting at an asking price of 50 pound and then probably take an offer of 45 as i say i've already had some interest so we'll see how they go Okay, next up, yeah, this is a bit of a punt really. It's pretty well brand new, modern, but vintage in style. It's a solid brass serving tray or butler's tray. It's enamel black base paint and it has um, what I consider to be highly decorative, if not stylized floral bouquet hand painted on the surface. So not particularly for practical use because you'd soon scratch or wear the paint on it. Um, so purely decorative really. Not much, in, if any, interest in it at the moment. It's listed for uh, £25. Um, probably taken off uh, around the um, £20 mark for it. It is highly decorative. Could be functional. As I say, I wouldn't particularly use it as a tray because it would damage it. But uh, nice item, solid brass, heavy, and can't really see anything similar online anywhere. If you can, drop me a link, let me know in the comments below, and I'll take a look. Uh, it may affect the price, bring it down, or even possibly put it up. But be interested to know what you think of that. It is one of those items that isn't antique or vintage, but it is decorative, and that's part of the ABC ethos. Um... You know, we do we do sell decorative items as well as the antiques and vintage. Next up, bit of work in stock. It's an antique copper planter. Uh, I think it's arts and crafts period, hand hammered with an embossed geometric design around the rim. So really nice planter. It's got a few, uh, quite a few views already, and. I, 
uh, it's currently listed at £30 because it's not that heavy uh, a gauge of copper. Um, but um, it is decorative and it definitely has an antique uh, period uh, patina to it. So nice item. They sell well. It's got watches already. But let's see if I get any offers in. Probably wouldn't take any less than £25 for that particular copper planter. Uh, next up is, surprise, surprise. This is an older antique planter. It is copper and it's jardinier style flower pot. I suspect it's uh, Indian looking at the engraving that's on it. Early 20th century, I would estimate it's heavier than the previous copper planter I showed you, which actually, by the way, is English made as well. Um, there's no maker's mark on this planter and I have it listed for $34.95. I certainly wouldn't sell this for any less than $30. I'd take an offer of $30 on it. But um, yeah, that's a great example and they sell well. So if you see them, snap them up. This next item was probably the biggest punt of the entire haul, really, um, because it's very subjective, really. It's purely decorative, although it could be used as a doorstop or similar. It's a, a brass, I don't think it's solid brass, but it's a, a brass stallion in the classical style on a wooden base. Paid up a little bit for it, and I've currently got it listed for £29.95. Could you try again? And I, I don't know where that came from then. Did you hear that? That was my uh, Apple Mac talking to me. <laughs> it just shows, doesn't it? You, be, you never know when you're being watched or listened to. It's um, That's weird, that is, but um, completely threw me. Anyway, I was saying, before I was so rudely interrupted, um, it's purely decorative, could be used as a doorstop. I think it's good quality. There's a slight split at the front of the um, of the horse's face. Uh, where the two castings were joined together. But I don't think that particularly detracts from it. And it's rock solid. The joint is rock solid, so it's merely a blemish. But I have kind of reflected that in the £29.95 asking price. And because of that, I would take an offer of £25. Uh, next up we have... Well, that's the end of the uh, listed items. I've had one sale um, from... The Malvern Hall, just the one. And just looking it up here, it is orders. All orders. Here we go. Um, it is, yeah, here we go. It's a vintage key rack made in Germany. Uh, or I should say it's a vintage key cabinet. It has five hooks inside and it's styled on a typical... Scandin well, got a Scandinavian or German house, and it's made of solid oak with a pewter front door um, that opens to reveal the five hooks. So, nice item, uh, and I think I achieved, I think it was listed for 25, and I took an offer of 20. Or I listed it at 20 and uh, I've got the asking price. I can't remember, to be honest. But I think £20 for a vintage uh, pewter and solid oak key cabinet. Good good sale price for me and a good price for the buyer. And I believe that's gone to Northern Ireland. Customer over in Northern Ireland. So that was the one sale so far from the haul of nine items sourced on that rainy day in Malvern. So there you go, rapid fire look through the haul uh, that, I, that I got from Malvern. One sale out of nine items. And um, early days at the moment, quite often these these sorts of items will, t will take up to a month, up to, well, up to three months to sell. That's no problem. 
Plenty of listings online in the eBay shop. As I say, link below if you want to check them out. And by the way, if you do purchase any of these items and you are a subscriber or even a viewer, let me know in the messages and um, I'll give you a shout out in the next film if you want. Uh, or just let me know anyway, really, because it's nice to know whether any of these sales are, are because of the YouTube channel. Yeah, just nice to know. And as ever, don't forget all you new subscribers, because we're nearly up to 300 now subscribers, which is absolutely amazing. I didn't even think I'd get 10. So I think we're a couple off 300. So if anybody out there who watches the films hasn't subscribed yet to support our little channel, and it is a community, the growing community, please subscribe and let's get over 300 subscribers in time for the next film. That would be absolutely fantastic. And... And I think if we do get to 300, let me know what subject you'd like me to cover in the next film. And if it's possible, I will do that as a kind of a 300 subscriber uh, video. Ah, well, there you go. So what are we looking at? Uh, I think that's probably the end of the film now. Uh, little, little departure from the norm with the feature on the etching, the Gerald... Brockhurst etching and a little whore film at the end. So hopefully there's something for everybody there. Hope you enjoyed it. Like, comment, subscribe and share this video. Please, that helps grow the numbers. And as ever, um, let me know where in the world you're from if you're a new subscriber and I'll add you to the digital subscriber map. Take care, stay safe and I'll see you next time.